As we uh, continue in our study on the uh, Bible reading program that we're going through, um, I've titled the message Prayer 101. I remember, uh, well, I, I read the quote actually before I saw the movie, but uh, some of you will remember or know of the name Vince Lombardi, who is a uh, longtime favorite coach of the Green Bay Packers. He was known for his uh, high levels of discipline and uh, training, uh, kind of a lack of a sense of humor, but uh, he uh, had winning teams, so nobody worried about it. Well, one day after a particularly lopsided loss uh, faced by the Packers to a team they candidly should have won, the uh, uh, coach came into the locker room and he said, gentlemen, we need to get down to basics. And he holds up a football and says, this is a football. To which I think Max McGee, one of the players in the back said, could you clarify that a little more? I think Max is still running laps. Uh, anyway, Prayer 101 this morning, we're going to be looking at a fairly well-known prayer, and we're going to be um, just looking at some, uh, some very, very basic things. I preached sermons on uh, this, using this title, with uh, like the Lord's Prayer. And that's usually when we think of a 101 or a basic prayer, and, and true it is. But I also think this one contains a lot of very useful information, not only for our prayer life, but for our Christian life. So we have, uh, Dear Lord, my prayer for this year is a fat bank account and a thin body. Please don't mix them up like you did last year. I've been praying that prayer for years, and yeah. The senility prayer that I'm going to read to you, grant me the senility to forget the people I never liked anyway, the good fortune to run into the ones I do, and the eyesight to tell the difference. I don't know, I just feel like no matter what I do, this cake won't nourish and strengthen my body. I don't know about you, but that last line I always used in a mealtime prayer. You know, I always thought about, yeah, I'm praying that over tacos. Yeah, I'm not sure. Yeah. yeah, we don't pray over pizza. I mean, come on, pizza's already holy, so, you know, we don't uh, do that Swiss cheese. At any rate, we're going to look this morning at uh, 2 Chronicles 7.14. We're going to look at it kind of in pieces, as it were. The book of 2 Chronicles begins uh, with God telling Solomon that um, he is, uh, you know, was, remember Solomon was uh, favored by God. Uh, Solomon, you know, prayed to the Lord when he was first uh, taking over as king. And he asked, uh, and God said, well, I will give you whatever you ask. And Solomon asked for wisdom, which surprised God. Because Solomon, you know, you get a blank check from God. What are you going to ask? It's like the three wishes from a genie, right? And so, you know, we were expecting him to, you know, I want riches and I want fame and I want all this and that. But he didn't. He said, I'm a young man and I want wisdom to lead this people. And so the Lord was impressed. He gave him the wisdom, but he also gave him the fame, the fortune, and everything else that he hadn't asked for. So Solomon was uh, very, very rich, and uh, he uh, started out by doing some really amazing things. Um, then he kind of crashed and burned, but we won't get into that part today. And so Solomon asked him to build the temple. And so he builds the temple, and this passage in 2 Chronicles is part of the dedication of the temple. If my people, who are called by my name. Let's pray together. Father, I thank you for this beautiful, simple, yet complex and profound prayer. Guide us this morning as we study, as we share together, that you would speak to each one of us through your spirit. This morning through your humble servant, that the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart would be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. 
if my people who are called by my name, a lot of times when we see the word if, uh, we can substitute a word since, okay? My people who are called by my name, since you are my people who are called by my name, and then we'll get into the, uh, to the rest of it. In Acts chapter 20, 11, verse 26, we find that the disciples were first called Christians at Antioch, all right? And so that's where we wear the name Christian. In the Old Testament, in Solomon's time, uh, Jacob's name was changed to Israel, and that was the name of God's people and uh, God's uh, purpose for the, uh, for the earth. For us, we were called Christians uh, when uh, the disciples were preaching at Antioch. Now, it's important to understand that the word Christian was not given to them as an award or a badge of honor or we're going to, you know, a very good compliment. Actually, Christian was more, uh, well, the vocal inton uh, intonations would be something like this. It's those Christians that are just doing and raising all this stuff that's going on. It's the Christians who make the Romans raise our taxes. Get the idea? Okay, it was a, uh, a slam, almost. Uh, we see this later on in uh, church history, Reformation in 1517. Um, your church history very quickly, or just church structure. Um, Christianity is a religion. It is a world religion, you know, meaning that it's celebrated all around the world. Uh, there are other world religions, uh, Islam, uh, Judaism, Buddhism, and a bunch of other isms, okay? Um, and there are different religions, so you um, wouldn't, a Buddhist wouldn't call himself a Christian, a person who uh, is a Hindu wouldn't call themselves a Christian, so on and so forth. And so um, Christianity is uh, a world religion, Christianity divided into two parts, uh, Catholicism, Roman Catholicism, and Catholic Protestant, okay? Uh, we're Protestants, incidentally, all right? Uh, and the word Protestant, guess what word that might have come from? Protest, okay? Protest. That was Protestants. Because you see, Catholic, the word simply means universal. You know, it's got a unity sense to it. And then these Protestants, like Martin Luther, who has his uh, uh, treatises that he uh, has come up with, nails them on the door of the Wittenberg Church, uh, which would be the same as posting to the church's Facebook page uh, a whole lot of years before Facebook came into being, all right? So that, that was his post, and uh, very unpopular, and, you think you see rabble rousing now with some people's posts. I mean, we're glad that many times you can post and nobody will say anything and they accept it. And all. Oh, that hasn't changed? Okay, yeah, same thing with uh, Martin Luther. So the, uh, the, the name, we wear the name. What is a name? You know? We wear the name Christian. If somebody says, now, be careful here, all right? But if somebody says that they are a Republican, okay, you would assume or hope that this person would uh, know and follow the platform of the Republican Party. If somebody's a Democrat, they would know and follow the platform of the Democratic Party, and Libertarians and you know, whatever other uh, types of parties that are out there. Now, if you stop me after church to lecture me on any of these points about Republican and Democrat, then I will know you weren't paying attention to the sermon and you missed the main point, okay? I have to do this with some of you, all right? If I'm a Christian, then I need to believe in the platform of the Christian language, which many of you are holding one. Okay? And the, the basic tenets and beliefs and understanding. And more importantly, not only believing them, 
because uh, the book of James tells us, oh, you believe in God, that's nice. <laughs> Satan believes in God, and get him anywhere. Well, no, you have faith in God, and you back it up with your actions. Very basic stuff, we know this. So if you are a Christian, you are backing this up with your humble attitudes and your actions. If my people, Christians who are called by my name, and we are called, you accepted Christ, you know that, okay? You are called. And if you would humble yourselves, and you're thinking, wait a minute, you need to humble yourselves and pray. Well, we'll get to prayer in a minute, but let's, uh, let's take a look at the humility thing. 1 Peter 5, 6 says, Humble yourself under the mighty hand of God that he will exalt you at the proper time. Um, this may uh, come as a shock to many of you, but uh, <laughs> humility is something we really don't have in our world today. Wouldn't you agree? And we need more humility on, from so many people, so many levels. And guess what, folks? Guess where it has to start? At the government, at the top, right? Well, it wouldn't be bad. It would be a good idea, actually. But it actually starts with us. It starts with the church because God says that we need to humble ourselves in praise. Why? Because if I am humbled, then I'm focusing on Christ. If I am not humble, then I'm focusing on everything else other than Jesus. If I'm not humble, then I'm focusing on the stuff that's important to me. It may be a political party, it may be an ideology, it may be the newest thing you read on Facebook, it could be any of those kinds of things. And if I'm focused too much on anything else, guess who I'm not focused on? You remember the old song? Turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full in his wonderful face, and the things of earth, will sing it with me, grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. So, one of the best ways that we dim the uh, the things. See, I would hope the light man would dim the lights, as I say dim. As we dim. And not so much. Okay. <laughs> there we go. All right. Yeah. And if everything else is dim, then the spotlight. You've seen it. You've seen the spotlight, you know, on certain things. You, you see... Uh, you see, I, I remember the Oregon Caves, okay? You go in there, and I don't think they do it anymore. Of course, they don't let anybody in there anymore. But uh, usually when you'd be tour it, you'd kind of stand still, and they'd shut all the lights off. Mm -hmm. Oh, there we go. He's on. And you can see him. <coughs> and, and just somebody would light a match or flip on the flashlight or something. And it was powerful. And so we have the light of God in our lives. Everything else is dim. Everything else we don't focus on because that light is so bright in our lives. Now, how does this happen? Well, of course, we have to get to the next phrase. There we go. And pray and seek my face. This one may seem obvious, but you know what? Our culture just doesn't get this. Okay? Of Well, they get the idea of praying, but they don't get the idea of seeking God's face. Here's a, uh, an illustration. This is kind of me ranting a little bit, so kind of bear with me. But I have heard this. It's almost becoming a daily occurrence as you listen to the news, as you listen to, uh, you know, just people talking about general things, especially when there's a catastrophe, a tragedy, there's a shooting, somebody dies of an ailment, whatever it may be, somebody will pipe up and say, you know, Let's, we need to, I heard a commentator, a, a news anchor, somebody that I let in my living room every week, you know, because, you know, I like the way they do the news. But they say, we're going to send our thoughts and prayers to that person. You ever heard that? Really a nice thought, but it's completely unbiblical, and it's completely 
wrong. Here's why. Number one, okay. yeah. Number one, I can't send my thoughts anywhere. Right? We see this, I can explain it to you, because actually this is a better one than <laughs> had Rob fixed it up. Guys swimming to help. Help, help, I need something. What's he say? Oh no, that's terrible. My thoughts and prayers are with you. <laughs> blub. <laughs> My thoughts, blub, blub. And prayers, blub, blub, blub. And guess what? You, go, you see the guy, you barely see the guy, you barely see his hand. And by the fourth time he says thoughts and prayers, um, and guess what? The guy needs a life raft, which incidentally is right next to the guy. You see, <laughs> it's right. I didn't notice that until just now. Yeah, the, the the life thing is like right there. It's like grab the thing and quit talking. We can't send our prayers, our thoughts to anybody, can we? I can barely keep my thoughts in my own head. I can barely deal with that going here. I can't send it to any of you. Not telepathic or psychopathic or whatever. You know, I can't I can't send my thoughts to you. And I better not be sending my prayers to you. You get the idea? Who do I send my prayers to? Good, you guys know the Sunday school answer. And that's correct. The only person I'm sending my God, my prayers to when I pray and I see whose face? God's face. Yes, I send my prayers to Him. Because if we pray to anyone else, if I try to send my prayers anywhere else, I'm breaking the first two commandments. Where God said in the Lord your God. And you will have no other gods before me. Make sense? You will have no other gods before me. If I'm praying to anything else or anybody else, then I am in bad shape. And the other thing that we need to pray, pray excuse me, and this will be a little radical, is as we pray for anybody, people that are on our prayer list, come in on the phone tree, uh, people will mention some today. Uh, when you hear prayers for anybody, you know what your first prayer should be? Our first prayer should be God's priority for them, which is for them to have a loving, abiding relationship with Jesus Christ. Does that work? First thing, here's why. Because if I'm praying for, and I use the fun term, I'm praying for Aunt Mabel's bunions. Although I think I'm getting a bunion. Is that a bunion I have here? You don't know, okay. I got, I got something on my foot here, okay? So I don't pray for Bob's bunions, doggone it, all right? It does hurt. I'm going to go to the doctor, but you know what? Here's the thing with my bunion. If my bunion gets healed... God miraculously heals my bunion. Actually, my foot doctor is probably going to sing this stupid thing down. But if he heals my bunion, guess what? In 63, eh, you know, 20 years, 25 years, if I'm not a Christian, my problem is not my bunion. My problem is where I'm going after I die. Make sense? Every, anybody you pray for on our prayer list, in the community, in the world, our government leaders, it doesn't matter. Anybody I pray for, pray for the first prayer should be that they have a relationship with Jesus Christ. Because, and every single, well not every, 99% of the people in the Bible that are healed, you know the guy that had his, uh, had his sight restored to him. Lazarus was raised from the dead. Guess what Lazarus did a number of years later? He died. It wasn't AI raised him to life and he's going to live forever. Nope, he died a, an old man. History doesn't give us a whole lot about that. Make sense? Our first prayer should be for that person's salvation. And then secondly, we can pray for Bob's.
Because yeah, we see this in scripture. Jesus looks at a paralytic. These guys had lowered him through the roof because they couldn't get into the house because of the crowds. They lure the guy down. The guy's paralyzed. Jesus walks up to him. First thing he says is, your sins are forgiven. Now, of course, the audience completely misses the point, like many other audiences when preachers stand up to talk. They miss the point. Here's the point. They go, well, he forgives sins. Who is he to forgive sins? Only God can forgive sins. Why is he forgiving sins? Look at the scripture. The vocal tones are mine, but that's basically how they sound. Okay? They're whining. They're complaining. And I imagine Jesus is like, oh, I could strike them with lightning, but I'm not going to. Um, okay. You know, which would be easy, he says, which would be easier for me to say? Your sins are forgiven or rise up and walk? Well, of course it would be easier to say your sins are forgiven because there's maybe no outside verification. But so that the people around here will believe that the Son of Man has the power to, to forgive sins. Get up, take your bed, go home, walk out of here. Which he did. Because the number one problem we have, uh, the number one health crisis, the number one virus that we have is not the coronavirus, is not Ebola, is not flesh-eating bacteria, it's not uh, smallpox. What is it? Sin. Because sin, if not dealt with, will kill 100% of the people it affects. 100% lethal. You don't believe me? Romans, what's Romans tell us? The wages of sin is, you're not going to feel good when you start to um, feel better about yourself than, than your sin will be. No. The wages of sin is what? Death. Death. But the free gift of God is what? Eternal life through Christ Jesus. That's the vaccination. That's the cure. That's what it is. It's that simple and it's that complicated. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and <laughs> this is where it gets interesting and turn from their wicked way Uh, we'll go back to that. Part of the reason, well, I think a lot of the reasons why maybe God doesn't listen to some of our prayers because our own voices and the voices of our actions and attitudes and thoughts and intents of our heart are not focused on Christ or God. And if I'm talking to somebody else, if I'm, you know, if after the service you'll sit where you are right now, which you won't, but if you were, and then if I walked over and visited with my good friend Teed, okay, guess what I'm not doing? I'm not visiting with my good friend Tom. Why? Simply, Tom's there, Teed's there. If I'm not praying to God, but if my actions, attitudes, and everything are focused on Satan, there's only two ways to go. There's no white lie. There's no little tiny sin. There's not this, just this once. Sin means you're missing the mark. Mathaitas means you're missing the mark. You either hit the bullseye or you don't. When I took archery in junior high, I either hit the bullseye or I hit the tire of the car that was in the parking lot 25 feet that way. I won't tell you which one I did. The car owner was not happy. At any rate, we missed the mark, don't we? We're not here to prove God answers prayer. We're here to be living monuments of God's grace. What do you think about that? It's an amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saves a great person like me. Uh, no, a wretch. Or wretched. John Newton was a safe slave trader. I mean, come on. Yeah, he was pretty wretched. But I can sing that verse. 
I was in the era where they were trying to rewrite the Bible. Oh, they're still trying to do that now, sorry. But, you know, these guys are like, I don't want to be a wretch. I had a professor stand up and tell me that. Just throw me nuts. They, and they changed it in some Bibles to save a one like me. That's ridiculous. I've seen that on screens and they want me to sing it at some conference. It's stupid. I have a fairly loud voice, you may have figured. So what I do is I start singing, save the rich like, you know. Everybody else is singing one. I'm singing wrench. Okay, I'm probably going to hell. But anyway, uh, that's what I mean. We're living monuments of God's grace. That he loves us, that he watches over us, that he has offered us salvation, salvation from sins. He has given us his blessing, his gifts. That's what I'm a monument to. A monument of answered prayer and a monument of his grace in my life. I turn from my wicked ways. And how do I do that? The prayer is already told us. We humble ourselves and we seek God's face and everything else grows dim at that point. Here's one. So, you know, I'm called to love my enemy <laughs> and pray for those who persecute me, right? Is that hard? Yeah. I'm called to forgive people who just totally shafted me. Is that hard? Yes. There are people, and I know you do too, there are people that I have a hard time forgiving. I have a hard time of releasing that bitterness. But if we don't forgive, we keep the bitterness. And somebody characterized bitterness is like bitter towards somebody. That means I drink the poison and I wait for them to die. That's bitterness. So if the opposite of bitterness is forgiveness, there's some people that are really hard to forgive. There are forgiveness in my life. There is forgiveness in my life that is really supernatural. In other words, I've got to pray to God to have him forgive that person. I've got to have him help, <coughs> excuse me, me forgive that person. And I have to do that a lot. There's some people I have to pray and think, oh yeah, God had me forgive them. Oh, I forgave them. <laughs> I forgave them. Yeah. Okay. I have to. Anybody got anybody like that? Yeah that I need to forgive them. Because their forgiveness benefits me a lot more than it does them. Now let me say a couple of things here. Number one, forgiving somebody is not the same as trusting them. Because I've heard people tell me that, and, and they'll say, well, I can't forgive somebody because I don't trust them, to which I say, it's two different things. Forgiveness means I'm releasing them from the offense that they did. I'm not holding it against them. Okay? I can do that. All right? God can help me do that. God has forgiven me a ton, so I can forgive somebody else a smaller amount. Here's the thing, though. But I can forgive somebody and not trust them. I can forgive somebody and still kind of, eh? okay? Because trust is built. Trust is earned. Forgiveness isn't. It's grace. It's extended. All right? Now, if a guy wants to receive the forgiveness, then, yeah, they're going to repent and do all the stuff we've had in prayer. Make sense? So, it, it may take me a while to trust that person again. I may not ever get back to the situation where the relationship has been restored. And the extent to which that happens, if I have truly forgiven that person, is not dependent on me. Make sense? There are some people that just aren't going to accept that forgiveness or repent and truly accept it. They just don't. And that's okay, because I have forgiven them. Make sense? Now here's one. So, if God knows what I am getting ready to pray, even before I pray it, right? I've searched thee, I know thee, I know that when you lie down, when you rise up, God knows our prayers even before we pray it. Even if we don't have the words, Romans tells us that he will even give us the words to pray if we're in a great deal of distress and pain and problems. So, prayer <coughs> is not informing God. 
prayer is reminding me. Now, let me give you a scenario, and I, I get this. Tom's had it, Teed's had it. it. It is just intriguing. Occupational hazard, we could call it. Somebody will call the church and pray for Bob's bunions. Actually, it's usually more serious. You know, pray for, you know, my, my friend has cancer, I mean, just lost a job, it's a tragedy. You know, pray for that. Okay. Now, your church is set up by God. Jesus Christ is the head of it, and for some cockeyed reason, he put people in it. And he put people in charge of it. So consequently, there's a rare occasions where maybe a prayer request will come across our desk, and maybe it gets lost in an email. I know none of you ever lose anything with email or phone messages, or you put write something on a piece of paper and the piece of paper disappears, or worse yet, you write the phone number on the piece of paper and don't write the name. It's a little hard. And so maybe that prayer request doesn't quite get sent out as soon as it is. Or I don't get the prayer out to everybody else because if I have 50 people praying for it, it releases God's power more than if one person prays it. That's like a great thought. Everybody has it. It's completely untrue. What does the scripture say? The prayer of a righteous man avail what? Much. One. Two or more are gathered in my name. And so that person, that prayer request didn't quite get out there. So that means God is hampered and we can't release him. I've heard that. I read that. I read such stupid things. The more they people pray, it releases God. From what? Who's the idiot that thought he could chain up God? Or open a door so he can peek through and have more power? Really? The God that I pray to candidly doesn't really need my prayer. I'm along for the ride. The, pray, the reason I pray is, yes, that he'll answer the prayer, but the prayer also says, you know, if, if I'm praying for, and I'll talk about him because he's not here and he's a prayer concern, we'll talk about him in a minute, my good friend Dan Forrest. Going through a tough time right now. Hello, Dan, you back there? I'm talking about you. Good. If I talk about my good friend Dan Forrest, if I call out the prayer chain for everybody to pray for him and all of that, but if I ignore my good friend Dan, if I don't ever call him or talk to him or do anything for him or listen to him, you see something wrong with that picture? I'm praying that God will listen to him, that God will provide for him, that God will give him strength. Just keep me out of it. Isn't that what we pray? Why isn't the church doing more for this person? Because you're the church and you're falling short. Right? Yeah. You pray it, do it. Because a lot of times, most of the time, pretty much all the time, God answers prayer through you and me. And if a bunch of people surround my good friend Dan, which they have, if that's not a miracle, I don't know what is. Love you, Dan. I will hear from heaven. <laughs> you know what? Let us know about the prayer concerns. You know, and most time we get them down, we remember them. I can't read minds. Oh, also, on the prayer list, here's something you can do for us. Uh, if I'm praying for somebody and they get the job, they're doing better after the ailment, can you tell us? It's great. Johnny and I are amazing people. We do a number of things God has gifted us to do. You know what God hasn't gifted us to do? 
read minds. I already said you can't send your thoughts. You might speak them once in a while. That'd be really helpful. Let us know what's going on. And if we don't get it written down, guess what? We may have forgotten because we're imperfect people. And you have to tell us again. We're perfectly cool with that. Oh, John remembers everything. Yeah, I, my mind's like a lightning one, brilliant flash, and it's gone. <laughs> totally. I will hear from heaven. And I'll forgive their sin and heal their sin land. Here's the thing about God's healing real quick. It's in his time, according to his will, according to his purpose, and according to his timeline. And I don't know about many of you, but God's timeline and my timeline just usually don't sync up real well. And that's not my fault. That's not my problem because I'm not God. Right? Which is a doggone good thing. God and I came to that arrangement a long time ago. He's God and I'm not. And so if he's doing something I don't understand, then I become like my three-year-old granddaughter and who would just want something right now. And if she's not getting it right now, she'll throw a fit because doggone it, she's not having that piece of candy that she needs and the Western civilization will crash if I don't get it. How many three-year-olds do I have in the crowd? <laughs> How many pray that way? She didn't understand if mom's not giving it to her or papa's not giving it to her. Papa's a soft touch, I'll tell you. He's a soft touch. Just ask grandma. Okay? Here's the thing. If God is not giving you what you're asking for, he's giving you something else. If God is not giving you what you're asking for, he is giving you something else. And the only reason I can say that is because that's been the way in my life. If I give God a multiple choice when I pray to him, then I'm missing the other 50 things that he may be trying to do. Because here's the thing, we've talked about this before, John even mentioned that one time introducing the song. True or false, God is at work in my life right now. True. True or false, God is at work in our world right now. God is at work even when I can't see him working. God is working in my life if I can't feel him working. Yeah. God is working. That's faith, folks. That's faith at its very essence is that if, you know, since God is working, I will forgive their sin and heal their land. Wow. And I know what that healing means, or I think I know what that healing means. For all of us now, as we're thinking about the, uh, the, the uh, um, virus, we want to get back to normal. The better question to ask is, how is God working through this virus? And I could preach you three more sermons right now, which I won't. But God is working through this church, through each one of us, through this virus. You know, we, we think about normal as getting back together. One thing here is going to be a preview of coming attractions. July 4th falls on a Sunday this year. The Buckaroos cancel. I don't know about the parade. The parade is on. Okay. Well, that's human. Okay. So here's what happens <laughs> when the parade is on. Guess what? Nobody can get to church. <laughs> around the parade around. Because it goes right by my front door practically. Here's the thing. So what we're going to do is on July 3rd. Saturday night here at the church. We'll get the time to you later. What we're going to do is we're going to uh, have a, uh, a worship service. But before that, we're going to have barbecue and just get together, potluck, and uh, eat and share. Nice weather. We'll be outside, you know, and just have a great time. Come in here, have a great time of worship and 
sharing, and talking about what <laughs> true independence really is. Not only from the British, but guess what? It's also uh, <laughs> from sin. And I heard an author make this quote, thinking about that potluck. I'm looking forward to that potluck. I love potlucks, don't you? We got some good cooks here. It's a spiritual gift with some of you. But an author put it this way, I want to end with this quote. One of the defining characteristics of Jesus' ministry, as reflected in the Gospel of Luke, is eating and drinking at all kinds of tables with all kinds of people. He was accused of being a glutton and a drunkard. He embodies salvation at welcoming with abundant tables. They're not just place where Jesus preaches, but they're a very embodiment of salvation. Salvation tastes like the wonderful meals Jesus sets before us, as well as, more importantly, the inclusion we feel at these tables. Everyone is welcome. Moreover, that salvation is wide, tangible, and present. At the table, the food is delicious, the food never runs out, and there's always one more chair. So this morning, if you're not sure of the seating arrangements, or if I have a place at that table, I invite you to share that with us. If you uh, want to talk to us about your relationship with Christ, we're certainly wanting to do that. Um, if you need prayer, our elders are always happy to pray for you. But let's stand together and sing this song, which it, it's a different arrangement of the one that sang before, but the wording may seem a bit familiar to you. And because I want you saying the verse as you leave today, or in my case, you sing the verse. Okay, you can do that too. And that be on key and tune. We sing and make melody with our hearts to the Lord. If my people will pray. And I ask each one of you to pray. And you are praying, many of you I know are, for this country, for this world, for just things that are going on. Let's sing this wonderful song together.